Thank you everyone for, for watching. I'm Greg Witcher. This is Dr. Tibet of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, we're going to talk about a few high yield pediatric fractures um, in, for our pediatric didactic month. And we're going to use his expertise to give us some insight in how to best manage these. Before we get started, Dr. Tibet, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, like your background um, and training and so on? So my name is Dr. David, one of the orthopedic uh, faculty at Texas Tech. I work uh, closely at the UMC and uh, the Children's Hostel. I uh, did my uh, pediatric orthopedic training at uh, Louisiana State University, which is affiliated to New Orleans Children's Hospital. And uh, I did my adult trauma in University of New Mexico uh, in Albuquerque for adult trauma. So I cover both adult and the children trauma. And uh, on my primary focus to do the, uh, my practice is, I say, 50% and 50%, 50% the children and 50% adults. And you will see me a lot in the pediatric ER, uh, seeing patients, evaluating patients, and also in the OR, if somebody interested, they're more happy to uh, come and to see the, uh, the surgical procedures. And if anyone wants to rotate with us also in the clinic, he can see the follow-up and how the treatment, our treatment impacted the patient's and family uh, life. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think you're the perfect person to give us insight. Then we'll have questions for you about not only the ED management, but as well, you know, how do we disposition these patients? Who can go home? Who needs to be admitted? And then what does their long-term course look like? So here we have a pretty... Um, common scenario, and we have a 15-year-old girl who landed on her left leg after jumping from six feet. So um, we can assume that this is a closed injury just to make things simple, but um, I think the important thing here is that on the AP radiograph, we see that there's displacement of the distal fibula, and in children, when you have the physis or the growth plate disrupted, um, you have to have special considerations for what, um, what might happen given the risk of growth arrest. Um, so can you talk a little bit about this in, in this kind of the context of the Salter-Harris classification and how you would ideally manage this fracture? So this uh, one of the uh, very tricky fractures. It can look uh, in the x-ray benign injury and very minimal displacement. However, it could be have a great impact on the patients. Giving the patients 15 years old, and uh, most of the, we always evaluate the fracture in the context of the child maturity, because if you're concerning with the gross arrest, most of the kids at the age of 15 years old are skeletally mature, and the risk of gross arrest is less uh, a concern. Okay? okay. So you will look at two factors. You mentioned one of them. One is uh, the gross arrest, which he, uh, if this is a kid nine or seven or six years old, that's a huge concern, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a very low threshold to order a CT in these injuries because once the, ex, uh, the, uh, the injury or the twisting ankle injury causing or the axial loading or the injury happened to the patients, it can go through the physial plate and was not, is not obvious on the x-ray. I see. So uh, you have, uh, as I mentioned, we have a very low threshold or a CT in these fractures. Mm -hmm. And especially go like a Sorter Harris 2, 3, or 4, the CT is one of your best friend to, to assess the degree of displacement and to confirm the injury as well. Okay. okay? So yeah. how does that change the management from the emergency department standpoint? If we get the CT um, and we do see... Um, a worse injury than we anticipated, is that necessarily surgical? Uh, surgical, we look at, we have the Salter Harris classification, as you mentioned, we uh, grade uh, Salter Harris one, two, three, up to five. Mm -hmm. uh, we have see the uh, Salter Harris one is just a growth through the physial plate. It does not involve the, the bone or the, the metaphysis or the epiphysis or go, the mm -hmm. fracture injury itself, go through the, epith or the physial plate itself. Mm -hmm. And there is very, um, uh, I say, people say half Salter Harris one, or it's very minimal injury to the gross plate. The kid has done this the fracture on the x-rays, but they have pain and the swelling and tenderness are not able to walk on that leg. And you get the CT, you get your oblique views, two oblique views, internal or external. 
and do the assessment look benign. And these patients need casting, need boots, uh, can boot to uh, need some sort of immobilization, either casting or splinting or a can boot. Mm -hmm. Okay, for maybe three or four weeks, and there after this would be more comfortable. We go to Sultan Harris too. You see the fracture or the injury or the fracture go through the physial plate and involve a small piece of the metaphysis mm -hmm. uh, here. Uh, and uh, Sultan Harris one or two, usually we would treat them with the non-operative management mm -hmm. in the form when if this place the fracture through Harris two, just need a closed reduction and conscious sedation. If you from a standpoint, you need a conscious sedation, you need mm -hmm. to check the patient in birth status and call the orthopedics because one of us need to come to do the uh, close the reduction under contrast sedation okay. and displanting. Okay, so uh, shoulder heresy three and four, we go to the second component of the concern about the uh, injury to the distal tibial fissa, which is the displacement at the articular surface. So it's technically is a interarticular fracture now, and we look for displacement amount of displacement of the uh, of the pathosis because of the uh, loss of the joint incongruity. We look for the number, the magic number is two millimeter of displacement. Mm -hmm. And that's why the CT come into place or come into play that we need a CT to measure the displacement, the maximum displacement and the three views, the axial and the coronal and the uh, uh, sagittal cuts and do mm -hmm. the measurement of the, uh, the, the amount of displacement. Mm -hmm. If it's more than two millimeter, look for uh, consider the surgical uh, surgical treatment, either a closed reduction, just a scoop, percutaneous screw to fix it and to compress or to close the gap, or sometimes the very ostium become entrapped into the fracture site and causing the, uh, we have to open and lift the soft tissues from the fracture site and then compress it with some screws. Okay. And usually the gross arrest for the younger kids says, this, say this is 10 years old or mm -hmm. seven years old. Mm -hmm. and has Salter has three or four and now the risk of con the concern for gross arrest is much higher okay so the younger the kid the severity of the injury uh, in uh, in in terms of Salter has three or four the risk of gross arrest is high so if the gross arrest happen in the mid portion or the middle portion of the epiphysis mm -hmm. this will cause shortening of the leg so that the leg becomes short Mm -hmm. But if the gross arrest happen on the periphery of the epiphysis, this means that the kid grow, the kid the the gross will be asymmetrical, causing deformity of the leg and shortening. Okay. So it can cause pure shortening or can cause shorten and deformity. So the ankle look into various or look into vulgus or maybe other uh, kind of deformities. Okay. 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 So. Uh, just to wrap up the the and then gross uh, the Salter Harris number five was the crushing injury. Maybe in this mm -hmm. patient, I mean, uh, landed her feet six feet, maybe causing some sort of uh, axial compression component mm -hmm. to the pathosis, mm -hmm. crushing of the pathosis or the facial plate, and the, then uh, the risk of uh, arrest is also higher, especially in younger kids. Mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. okay, so this 15 years old, the amount of displacement, I won't be a little bit worried about this because of the, uh, uh, of the age of the patient, almost uh, kids, uh, either girls or boys at that age, uh, skeletal immature and the amount of in, uh, affection or effect on the gross is less and less, less important. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. Then, then another point, important point from the ER standpoint of view as well, mm -hmm. what's called the triplane fracture. Triplane fracture means the distal physis of the tibia has a very specific closure pattern. It doesn't close like over weeks or months. It takes two years to the entire epiphysis to, uh, to, uh, to close mm -hmm. and reach the skeletal maturity. Mm -hmm. So if any, for any injury happened within this two years, within the, uh, the window of two years of, of closure of the epiphysis mm -hmm. or the facial plate, the transition fracture happened, which means part of the epiphysis is closed, part of it is still open. Mm. So when you have a twisting injury, all those forces go to the line of least resistance. Mm -hmm. So they will go through the epiphysis, uh, the, the unclosed portion of the, of, the, of the epiphysis and can, I mean, avoid the stronger part with the closed part of the epiphysis, which technically is a bone right now. 
Mm -hmm. You understand this point? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. causing the specific fracture that it was called a triplane fracture. Triplane tri fracture. Tri tri right. fracture. And this is specific fracture pattern that happened in the, uh, in the kids uh, around the skeletal maturity when part of the, of the facial plate is open and part is closed. And that for boys and girls is different? Um, yes, because yeah, mm -hmm. we look for two things. We mm -hmm. look for, we have the patient chronological age. You mentioned patient chronological age was 15, right? Mm -hmm. But the bone age is, a, the bone age which matter with the maturity of the kid. Right. Say if okay. the kid is 15, but his bone age 16, he's right. one year ahead. Mm -hmm. The same you look for tenor uh, classification for the pubic hair, breast mm -hmm. budding, and mm -hmm. the size of the testicles and stuff like that, and menses. You have to look. So, so some kids uh, reach skeletal maturity very, uh, very early on, like, 12 and they met you, especially in girls. I see, so it's a variable thing. A variable, so, yes, depending on yeah. the puberty, what time right. of the puberty. That's very interesting. So for these kind of injuries, depending on the age, we should have a low threshold for CT. CT, yes. Mm -hmm. We should be thinking about the Salter-Harris classification, especially yes. uh, uh, if we see a lot of displacement we might uh, have to uh, intervene surgically. Surgically, and, yes. Um, then in certain cases, you could deal with something called a triplane fracture. Yes. The growth plate is affected because it's both open and closed because of the injury and it will probably lead to a deformity, I presume, yes. down the road. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, as I told you, you have to be very careful in saying the kid, your ankle is good, you have just to sprain your ligaments, you're mm -hmm. fine, go mm -hmm. home. No, mm -hmm. just be careful because once you see in the x-ray, the, the physial plate is open or the, mm -hmm. the physis is open, mm -hmm. most likely the, because of the ligaments in kids are stronger than the physis. Right. If you have a twisting relative injury. Relative strength, yeah. The, yeah, relative strength. You most likely have physial injury rather than ankle sprain. Mm -hmm. So it's different from adult patients. Adults have uh, the the, the are closed, mm -hmm. and the ligaments are weaker than the bone. So usually, when you have a twisting ankle injury, you usually to you usually uh, injure the ligaments before the bone before get fractures. Right, right. That's the fundamental concept yes. for pediatric yes. orthopedics. Pediatric. Right. You injure the abscesses first, mm -hmm. then you injure the ligaments, and then the end injure your bone or break your bone. Okay. So you have to be first aware of epiphysis, that. second ligaments, third yes. bone. So you should, yes. can you assume that there's a, a ligamentous and epiphyseal injury if it's you see good, a fracture? It could, yes. Okay. All right, okay. let's go to the next slide. That's really interesting. Great insights. Thank so you. We're again, talking about the ankle here and in, in a skeletally mature woman, um, girl um, who had a twisting injury and now has this fracture. And this is sort of a kind of board review question. We see that there's some discontinuity in the, on the medial, excuse me, the lateral side yeah. of the tibia. Um, and then if you look at the lateral projection radiograph, you see that there's a fragment that's anteriorly displaced. Um, so from what I know, this is called a Talo fracture. Yes. I think it's pretty um, kind of textbook. Is this a rare fracture or common fracture? It's common, can happen in children. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the more busy our children hospital is, the, the more you guys, you will match your work at different place in the ER, the more mm -hmm. busy the ER, the more chances to get these kind of fractures. And mm -hmm. the anterolateral part of the, uh, of the distal tibial uh, articular surface and the same thing, the same concept, I get a CT. Okay. And order a CT to, uh, to uh, measure the displacement. Mm -hmm. And most likely this fracture need fixation. Okay. Either open okay. or closed. Most likely, we have to open and reduce it and put a screw across it because this is one of the attachment to the uh, uh, the anterior tibiofibular ligaments or the attachment for the syndesmotic ligaments for the I see. I see. for the ankle joint. Okay. All right. Well, that's some good review of the anatomy there. Let's switch gears and let's look at another common area of injury in kids, and we're talking about supracondylar fractures here. Now, I, this is not a specific case, just some radiographs from Radiopedia, but um, this, uh, what, is, what is notable is that on the lateral projection, we see a posterior fat pad, which in my mind is, a, is always a pathological finding. Um, however, I would say that the 
anterior humeral line and the radiocapitellar line look pretty unremarkable here. So um, I believe from my orthopedics rotation, I learned this should be classified under the Gartland system and it would be a Gartland one fracture. Um, and this is a patient that I, as an emergency physician would think could probably go home with a posterior slab splint and follow up in clinic. Is, is that all correct? Yes, I agree with this 100%. So okay. the posterior fat bad sign is one of the radiographic markers for occult or non-displaced type one subracondylar fractures. Mm -hmm. And before, uh, I mean, that's the most important thing you can see. However, I like the idea that you check the, the radiocapitular line. That's very important. I don't like to miss any Montegia fracture dislocation, mm. especially in kids. Okay. And also the uh, other thing that can be easily missed, which is a medial epicondyle of the, of the humerus. Okay. So medial epicondyle, which is uh, on the medial side of the elbow around the start to ossify or to appear on the elbow around the age of the first grade. Five to six years old, you have to look for the uh, medial epicondyle. If you couldn't see it, most likely inside the joint. It's fractured and displaced and interrupted into the uh, elbow joint. Okay. So you look for the radiocapitular joint, uh, especially with patients that in only some, some patients with the Montagia, non-displaced Montagia, they have only uh, plastic deformation. It doesn't have to be very uh, complete, obvious, displaced the fracture, okay? Okay. So look for the radiocapitular line, make sure the radial head is aligned with the capitellum, mm -hmm. and then look for the medial epicondyle. And the other thing that, uh, other injury that also can be missed is the lateral condyle fractures. The right, same so hold that here. thought. We're gonna go to the next slide. Oh, next slide, okay. So you, you kind of transitioned into that perfectly. So I'm gonna yes. move this. So um, what we're looking at here is a is an eight-year-old boy who fell off his bike onto his elbow. And you're getting into the, the crito, I think, system for classifying the time ossification centers appear. Mm -hmm. um, so here, I think what I'm seeing is a, if it's an eight-year-old boy, um, the lateral epicondyle has this, what appears to be a fragment, and there should not be an ossification center in an eight-year-old boy um, at the lateral epicondyle. It's too early. Is that correct? Yes. And then uh, you have to look for the fracture lines. And this one of the fracture that we emphasize uh, are the two views of the elbow are not enough. We need to okay. get oblique views, okay. okay, internal and external. So or at least the uh, three views of the elbow to get the uh, idea about the uh, uh, non-displaced or minimal displaced or less obvious lateral condyle fractures of the humerus. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, what we, what we see on the x-ray, we just, we can see only the ossific nucleus of the lateral condyle, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, however, the, bone, the, uh, the cartilage itself is bigger than that. So the x-ray does not necessarily reflect it, what, what the reality is. So you have to, if the fracture line went through the cartilage, this means that the, the fracture will not be as obvious on the x-ray. That's why we need to see oblique views. And also on, on my end, if I have a doubt, so are there two half two options, either, either order MRI to check the uh, lateral condyle fractures, mm. or I, take, I took the patient back to the OR, inject a dye into the joint, I do arthrogram of the elbow so if I can visualize more of the distal humerus, I can see the amount of displacement and the true displacement of the lateral condyle of the humerus. Okay. Uh, okay. That's, uh, that's the way we, we manage it. Because wow. we have the two classifications system. Mm -hmm. One is called MILCH classifications, M-I-L-C-H, -L okay. type one and type two. And then mm -hmm. we have Jacob classifications which measure the amount of displacement of the lateral condyle. So Jacob means uh, less than five, uh, five, ten, five, ten, uh, five millimeter of displacement, the Jacob one, and then between five and ten two. And then if the lateral condyle is completely uh, displaced and rotated, with the articular, uh, with the fracture line display, with the articular surface uh, of the distal humerus displaced into the fracture site. 
Mm -hmm. So can you talk about yes. it, would this would this cause a lot of morbidity? Should this be missed the fracture? Yeah, of the definitely, lateral? this one of the catas you can't miss this fracture. Okay. Because if what are the consequences the of that? Consequences is very uh, very known in orthopedics. One of the classic orthopedic conditions, okay. and especially in Jacob type three, when the fracture uh, rotate uh, the articular surface itself rotate and displace into the fracture site. So this means that the patient will develop non-union of the lateral condyle and this causing mm -hmm. a cubitus uh, valgus deformity of the distal humerus. Mm -hmm. And the cubitus valgus, as the, kid, as the kid grow, this will stretch the medial, the ulnar nerve on the medial epicondyle, the, uh, on the medial side of the, of the elbow and called uh, delayed ulnar or tardy ulnar balsy or delayed presentation of or uh, of the ulnar nerve. So the okay. patient had numbness and tingling of the uh, binky and fourth finger okay. with the uh, typical deformity of the, uh, of the, uh, of the fingers of the uh, fifth and fourth fingers of the hand. I see. Yeah, I've, I've heard this is a commonly missed fracture and it's good yes. to hear what the consequences would be that valgus deformity and stretching. Cubitus valgus, yes. Cubitus valgus and or stretching of the ulnar yes. nerve. Ulnar okay. nerve, increase the carry called carrying angle of the uh, of the of the distal humerus. Carrying angle increase that's called uh, cubitus valgus deformity. The carrying angle. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 And so, the opposite happened in subracondyl fracture. Patient was malunion of the subracondyl fractures. If say the fracture displaced, we didn't treat the fracture, or we treated the fracture and then secondary the fracture displacement even after operative fracture uh, fixation, the patient developed cubitus verus deformity, which is the opposite of the cubitus right. valgus deformity. Okay, okay. Okay. So these are kind of common pediatric fractures and they have opposite consequences. It helps remember it a little more easily. Yes. So let's take a step back though and talk about the Crito system for identifying these, um, these ossification centers. Is that how you learn these? That's sort of like basic knowledge for you at this point. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I encourage you to develop your mnemonics, but one of this or the common mnemonic we use for ossif uh, for remembering the ossific centers of the distal humerus and the elbow. Okay. Because I told you, say the first at the first grade, fifth or six, uh, five to six years old, you have to look for the medial epicondyle and have to see it. If you okay. see, so you can see in this X-ray, you can see the medial epicondyle very obvious. Okay. Yeah, because this is eight years old. But if you couldn't see it, that means this a patient is has a fracture of the medial epicondyle, and uh, usually it's uh, it trapped into the joint. Okay. Okay. So for okay. our listeners, the kritos is C R I T O E. Yeah. And that's starting with the ossification center at the capitellum. Then we have the radial head. The head. Yeah. Then we have the medial epicondyle. The trochlea is the T, the O being the olecranon, and the E being the lateral epicondyle. Yes. I'm just, uh, I need to touch a little bit on the milch classification of lateral condyle. Okay. Was, uh, with a fracture line. Uh, does not involve the trochlea of the distal humerus, this milch type one, but the fracture, if the fracture line extending to the uh, trochlea of the distal humerus, the elbow will be completely unstable. The elbow is dislocated like an uh, intraarticular fracture. Mm. And this was one of the morbidity factors or the morbidity uh, risk or problem with the lateral condyle fracture. Can the elbow can completely dislocate it uh, because of this fracture? I see. I see. Okay. So you go to systematic read of the x-ray. You look at the fat bad sign, mm -hmm. uh, front and back, mm -hmm. look for the medial epicondyle, look for the lateral condyles, check the radial head for fractures, for uh, dislocation, mm -hmm. radio capitular lines, mm -hmm. and then look for the electronon, mm -hmm. and then look for the fracture line above the electronon fossa, which is uh, sobracondyl fractures. Super most typically and uh, kids yeah around one or two years the young kids first years of life the transphysial separation this one of the uh, pathognomonic factor or fractures for child abuse as well oh, transphysial fractures yeah transphysial fracture in the first yeah. years of life yeah yeah so first that, that's a good review that system for reviewing an elbow x-ray since we're going to look at so many of these as emergency physicians we look for the anterior fat pad, the posterior fat pad, the anterior humeral line, the radio capitellar line. We look for um, displacement of the radial head and then um, transphyseal fracture you mentioned in the end. Yes. Perfect. All right, let's go to the next one. 
So this is a little more of a discussion. Um, I just want to pick your brain about open fractures. And I want to talk about mild open fractures, like a poke hole open fracture, like we're seeing in this image here. Is there any instance where you think it would be appropriate for a patient to be sent home for follow-up in clinic with a poke hole fracture due to say a, just like this example, maybe a forearm, a both bone forearm fracture, or is that a necessary admission for operative management? I said, depend on the fracture, say this is uh, 10 years old, has a radius on a fracture, need mm -hmm. operative management. We, most of the time, kids older than eight years old with the uh, radius on a shaft fracture, Mm -hmm. Yeah, this need to be admitted okay. and need to uh, be uh, IV antibiotics uh, okay. for the f open fracture and for the, uh, uh, the post-operative management after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, my point is, book holds, of, uh, book holds that we can see on the ED does not reflect the amount of damage. We just the grade one or still type one, mm -hmm. the skin injury does not reflect the... Uh, uh, the amount of damage to the muscle, to the bone. So we should see. be uh, very careful about sending this patient home. Mm -hmm. But if the patient say, uh, and the contamination as well, if the patient in the playground, bad area, unclean area, I mean, need mm -hmm. to be careful about, have okay. to talk to the patient in details, get the story and look for the contamination as well. Perfect. However, say if the fracture, say some literature saying the patient non-displaced the fracture, book holds the fracture of minimal displaced or a fracture need the close the reduction with book hole fracture. Some people, you can get the conscious sedation, get the ortho involved, get the fracture reduced, and then you can send patient home with PO antibiotics uh, safely. But you have to see the patient in the first available clinic to make sure the wound is not infected, the patient didn't develop osteomyelitis. But this, yeah, but this is a fracture, operative fracture, say for whatever reason, shaft, this or humerus, physical injury, need to be addressed operatively yeah, we usually extend the incision, make it bigger, look for the damage more, dam okay. the, the more damage to the soft tissues, uh, and then address the, wash it with a generous amount of saline solution and wash mm -hmm. it very good, and mm -hmm. then deal with the fracture with operative management as appropriate, and then close the wound and splint the patient as needed. Okay, so just to recap, the damage that you see just from the exterior may not reveal how much uh, yes. damage was done to the soft tissue. And that's one indication that this patient needs to go to the OR. There yeah. are rare cases when patients can be sent home for immediate follow-up, but they should be seen by an orthopedist before ever doing something like that. Yes, I agree okay, 100%. Perfect. All right. So um, here we have a both bone fracture. Um, I want to just specifically ask you, I've heard community physicians saying they can sometimes struggle with reductions of these both bone forearm fractures. Do you have any um, general tips for reducing these in an emergency department setting rather than the OR? So, uh, the, I mean, this injury, I mean, it doesn't have to be reduced right away. And the key point that they get the look at the age of the patients, amount of each age of patient has acceptable or uh, amount tolerated. of displacement, tolerated uh, displacement. Mm -hmm. So we have to put all factors together. And uh, we, uh, I mean, these injuries have to uh, emphasize the, the, uh, the fact of remodeling. Remodeling means that there is certain amount of deformities can be tolerated, can be uh, accepted and that mm -hmm. the kids grow the bone corrected alignment as the kids grow, okay? Okay. You think it doesn't remodel. If the kids are older, so have less than two years of growth remaining, the remodeling okay. is very, very minimal. You have to okay. have at least two years of growth remaining, okay? Okay, okay. Number two, uh, you have to closer to the, uh, the most active growth plate to the extremity. Say, for example, for the the knee, the distal femur epiphysis and proximal TV are the most active epiphysis in the lower extremity. Mm -hmm. So the closer to the knee, uh, to the femur, uh, the distal femur physis and the closer to the proximal femur, uh, tibial physis, the chance of remodeling is very high. Mm. The elbow is, uh, the, the upper extremity is very, uh, is different okay. because most of the upper extremity grow from the proximal uh, humerus physis and grow from the distal 
uh, radial physis. Okay. So if the fracture closer to the rest, the remodeling is high as well. So we can accept more. If the fracture proximal to the proximal humerus or the upper end of the humerus, that means the acceptance, I'm sorry, the, uh, the amount of deformity we accept a little bit higher, okay? Okay, okay. For the elbow, it doesn't grow much. So the elbow only grow 20% of the height of the, of the length of the upper extremity, only 20%. Okay. That's why we treat most of the elbow injuries with operative management. Mm -hmm. We are very aggressive treatment uh, elbow fractures with, uh, with surgery because the remodeling is very, very, very minimal. Okay? I see, I see. So, so once we decide, we look at the x-ray, measure the uh, uh, angulation in both views, AP, a lateral view, by the way, this lateral view is oblique view. It does not give, give you the reflection of the true displacement. I will send this patient back to the ED, to the X-ray, say I need a good lateral uh, view of the uh, forearm mm -hmm. because this is not acceptable, okay? Okay. okay? And I'm glad that you mentioned this uh, X-ray or you presented the X-ray because this forearm fracture is one of the injuries that uh, emphasize the importance of you have to get one joint above and one joint below the fracture. Okay. You can't get just a sketch or a very small view or group the picture just to see the fracture, ignoring right. the elbow, ignoring, ignoring the rest. Mm -hmm. For two reasons. One is Montegia fracture dislocation. You have a fracture ulna, but if you don't have X-ray of the elbow, dedicated film, uh, film of the X-ray or uh, focus or X-ray of the elbow, you won't see the radial head dislocation, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is Galeazzi fracture dislocation. You have isolated radius fracture with this location of the radio distal uh, or the inferior uh, radio ulnar joints, you won't be able to see it unless you get x-rays of the rest. Okay. okay? So these, these x-rays here we're looking at are adequate though. Adequate. You can visualize, adequate. but they are missing a lateral view. And then as you said, yes. for your elbow fractures, you like to see a third view, the oblique view. Yes, oblique okay. view. So this so assessment looks good. I just mm -hmm. the patient back to get more uh, through lateral of the forearm to, okay. uh, to, to get accurate measurement of the amount of displacement. Say this fraction need reduction. And now we have to, can we do this without pain medication or without, uh, I mean, conscious sedation? No, we need to get Probably the patient. Not. No, not. We need the patient to be comfortable and get mm -hmm. the uh, uh, reduction right. And mm -hmm. need the fluoroscopy. We have a privilege here in the UMC that we have a small fluoroscopy or right. a mini arm. We can see our reduction uh, uh, immediately on, on the spot. Mm -hmm. We can check our reduction right away. But mm -hmm. some places doesn't have that. You have to get the reduction, feel it, and then send the patient for x-ray, check it. If you don't like it, take the spin down and redo it, which yeah. is time consuming and uh, is, not, uh, is not a good technique. No, okay. but I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot mm -hmm. of us will be in community practice in the future and might not have yes. the luxury of the C-arm and have to think about that being a real possibility if it's the yeah. middle of the night and uh, the kid, you know, we just want to get the kid to clinic or the orthopedist is not in-house or so on. So that's yeah. really good to think about. Okay, yeah. great. And then we decided that we need the um, control sedation, we need the equipment, we need the cast, we need the splint. And then if you uh, ortho with you, I mean, you get involved if possible. Yeah. And uh, then we do the reduction maneuvers. So the patient now is comfortable, get the constant sedation, have the C-arm, have the equipment, mm -hmm. and then you do the uh, reduction. So this the patient look for the apex of the deformity. So this patient look as the apex uh, pointing toward the radius, apex lateral. So we need to little bit of attraction to, or you can, some pe people do the finger, the Chinese finger traps mm -hmm. and to get the muscle uh, ready for reduction. And then you mm -hmm. do the reduction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I usually just do the attraction okay. and try to uh, uh, do the opposite or the correction, uh, do the correction in opposite direction of the deformity. So this patient has an apex toward the radius, apex lateral deformity, mm -hmm. and has also on lateral view, as you can see the apex posterior deformity. So I need to push the distal part of the forearm to the front anteriorly. Mm -hmm. I need to push the distal part of the forearm uh, more toward the ulna or medially. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, have somebody do that uh, counter traction from the elbow, somebody do the traction from the rest, mm -hmm. and they do the correction in that direction. Okay, And then right. after we finish, just with the batting, cast batting, and the displint. Uh, because of risk of compartment syndrome, it's safer if you are not, uh, if you are by yourself, to just do the sugar tongue splint 
or a long arc splint. Mm -hmm. uh, avoid circumfer circumferential cast because of the swelling and the reduction and the, the mm -hmm. manipulation of the mm -hmm. arm, mm -hmm. and the injury itself, all these factors. Uh, may increase the chance of developing acute compartment syndrome. Okay, right. That's always a risk. Okay, always a risk. With yeah. uh, injury reduction, tight cast, the three factors can contribute to the development of acute compartment syndrome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Great. well, you make it sound reduction. easy, but I know it's not always that easy. So, I, I just need a few cases to do it. Uh, yeah. it's just a matter of experience. Need more. The more you do, the more comfortable you're doing it. Of course. And of course. after you do the splinting, you do the molding of the cast, little bit of a mold mm -hmm. in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. It's called a three point uh, molding of the cast mm -hmm. to uh, maintain the reduction you achieved by the reduction maneuver. Because uh, if the cast is, uh, is not well molded, the displacement inside the splint or the cast will be, uh, will be a problem down the road. But we'll take care of this in the clinic. Right, right, right. Okay, awesome. Good. Another good discussion. Let's go to the next one. So uh, this, I believe, is second to last. We're moving to the lower extremity. Now, again, we have a toddler, a three-year-old, who jumped off the sofa and presents with this x-ray. So I'll just summarize what I see. I see a pretty obvious spiral fracture of the tibia and uh, no other osseous abnormalities. So this is a pretty common thing. Should this raise suspicion for non-accidental trauma or is this something we can anticipate being just part of um, kids playing in a, in a traumatic injury? No, this is not the classic fractures for non-accidental trauma. Mm -hmm. It can happen. And the definition of toddler fracture, tibia fracture, most of the time or almost most of the time is that fibula is intact. So the fibula okay. is intact, no fracture okay. fibula. Okay. Uh, you can see this fracture pattern and non displaced the fracture. Yeah. And the kid just stopped walking. He was running, playing, and then all of a sudden, uh, maybe the mom, the parent didn't watch the kid stop walking. So mm -hmm. this should be red flag for you to get an x-ray. Don't say, hey, we're good, this just the kid is some, doing something funny. Get an x-ray, review the x-ray, because sometimes it's very tricky. You see it one view, it's not very obvious. You see, look at the lateral view, a little bit of a crack, but it's not very obvious as you can mm -hmm. see it on the AP view, okay? okay? Okay, And you have to combine this with the clinical exam of the kid. He stopped running and stopped walking. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. very, uh, very important. Right, okay. So, so, okay. so in x Fibula is intact. Fibula is intact, non displaced the fracture of the tibia around the age of two to three years old, around three yeah. years old, this toddler, classic pattern of toddler fracture. Toddler fracture, right. And yes. these can be very subtle. And I know the one I'm yes. showing here is pretty obvious, mm -hmm. um, but management, this is an outpatient um, injury as far as I am aware. This should be splinted and seen in clinic as soon as possible. Yes, and uh, yeah. It should be this is the classic management. Just coming back to the non-accidental trauma, I just give a touch base with it very quickly. So the okay. no one that need to be uh, suspicious of non-accidental trauma, uh, I, I'm sure that everyone know that uh, femur fracture, non walking a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they have a femur, mm -hmm. and the kid didn't start walking yet. This is child abuse case. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, okay. Number two is metaphyseal corner fracture. See the distal femur proximal tibia. Metaphyseal corner fractures of the uh, of the metaphysis. That's those one of the, the criteria. Bucket handle fractures. Is that what yeah. those are? Okay. Yes, and this is number two. Number three, posterior hip uh, rib fracture, fracture of the ribs in the posterior part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then multiple fractures and the fracture in different stages of healing. See the tibia is fresh fracture. See the humerus have a callus formation. Mm -hmm. Femur has a different mm -hmm. different stage. So multiple. Uh, fractures mm -hmm. with uh, different stage of, stages of healing. Okay. And that might be something you see on like a skeletal survey. Probably. So yeah, skeletal survey. Perfect. So this we need to uh, need a skeletal survey. All right. Good. And that's one of the, um, but this toddler can happen in normal life, can happen with kids without uh, the risk of uh, non accidental mm -hmm. trauma. Mm -hmm. But those are uh, those others you mentioned are the high yield. Yes. For, and come to the exam training. as well, because this one of the, it can endanger your license. You have to be careful mm -hmm. and you have to get the social worker involved mm -hmm. and uh, know your uh, hospital policy because most of the children hospital, any kid with broken bone, they, end, they get the social wo uh, worker involved to make sure the story makes sense. If the story doesn't right. make sense, they notify the child protective services. Mm -hmm. 
Good, okay, thank you. Well, let's get to the last slide here. This is not unlike a case that I saw in RED. We had a 14 year old boy who had an ATV accident where he stretched out his leg and um, was, was uh, it kind of ejected from the ATV and the x-ray looked like this. So what, this is a little more grainy than the last radiographs, but I think what the, the um, finding is most significant for is that the, the tibial eminence, in other words, the, the most superior aspect of the tibial physis epiphysis looks to be fractured in the AP and the lateral view. Um, and so and I, the importance of this is the attachment of the ACL to the anterior cruciate ligaments. Right. And this also as well because of the most of the cartilage, sometimes it's not very obvious in the regular x-ray, you can see a little bit, but uh, you feel the knee, patient has hemarthrosis, Mm -hmm. and get injured in soccer or football players, some sort mm -hmm. of sport of injuries. Mm -hmm. And this is the attachment of the ECL ligament. And uh, there is a classification for this with non displaced fracture is type one, type two is a fracture is hinging on the posterior cortex. And then the type three is the one that uh, uh, completely displaced tibial eminence, okay. uh, a fracture. And okay. this fracture is some, I mean, uh, at least type three uh, need uh, operative fixation with sutures and to get the knee stable because this is the attachment of the ACL ligament. Okay. And this is very important to, to treat this fracture with surgery, but need a CT so what study would be the CT or MRI? After? Uh, advanced imaging. This one of the engineer okay. advanced imaging. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Good. Well, I don't want to take too much of your, more of your time. It's been really insightful. So um, unless you wanted to say anything else, I'm gonna stop there because those are the images I wanted to review. Yeah, I think that's very, uh, very useful. And uh, just be careful with the kids. Any kid that refuse to walk, mm -hmm. you have to look for trauma fractures, okay. look for infections, yeah. and uh, look for septic, uh, uh, septic arthritis of the hip. Yeah, yeah. And okay. uh, especially you have to be very careful. Any patient was presented with knee pain really have to spend some time examining the hip. Okay. Yeah, you examine the knee, that's okay. And, uh, but you have to look for the hip. Don't forget to examine the hip. It could be skiffy, slipped, uh, slipped uh, epiphysis, okay, okay, upper femur epiphysis, skiffy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. could be uh, infections, could be proximal femur osteomyelitis. Just to spend some time with the kid that has knee pain, examine the hip, examine the whole child, ask for uh, the last three weeks or four weeks has a upper respiratory tract infection mm -hmm. and uh, causing uh, transient size vice of the hip. Uh, patient is uh, refused to weight bear, fever, ESR, and CRB, the cocor criteria for septic right. hip. Coker don't forget, criteria. yes, yeah. yeah. Don't forget uh, these kids. And also, don't forget the non accidental trauma. Yeah. And this one of the fractures or the injuries that can endanger your your license and your practice. That's mm -hmm. very important to pay attention to this. Yeah, we'll have a whole nother lecture on that. And like you're getting at, I didn't even get into these non-traumatic conditions like septic arthritis, skiffy, and transient synovitis and so on, but they're always good to have on the differential. Of course. Perfect. Thank you so much for the time. Right, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day. Have a great evening. You too. Look Thanks so much. Looking forward to working with you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.